こんにちは。よろしくお願いします。My name is Samir Deshmukh, also known as Wardro on GitHub and Twitter. I am from the city of Pune in India, and this is a city of about six million people on the western coast of India. It's also known as the Oxford of the East because it has about 600 colleges within the city. Currently, I'm a master's degree student at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Studying high performance computing. I am living in the amazing city of Tokyo, and、uh, I've been living here for the past eight months. And wish you all a lot from the amazing Japanese people over the next、uh, few years of my stay.、Uh, I am a committer to the Ruby Science Foundation,、uh, or also known as Sci Ruby in for short. Sci Ruby is an organization dedicated to making Ruby a better language for scientific computing and data analysis. I maintain several libraries for this purpose, some of which I, I will be talking about today. This is the third time in a row that I'm speaking at Ruby Kaigi, and I'm really excited to be here. The first time I spoke, it was about a gem called Daru, which is a data frame library for Ruby, similar to Pandas and Python.、Uh, that first talk was the pivotal moment for Daru, you can say, and ever since that talk, it has seen more than 185,000 downloads on Ruby gems. And it has the various people have developed various plugins for this gem, along with many contributors. I made some many I made some Japanese friends on this talk, and、uh, after they came to know that Daru means sake in Hindi, which is the Indian official language, they introduced me to this, which made my stay very memorable in Japan. The second time I came here,、um, I talked about Rubex, which is what I will be talking about more today. Ever since that first time I, I spoke about Rubex and introduced it to the world, it has seen more than 120 commits and is a, is a much more stable and usable language than ever before. This time I will be speaking about a much more improved and polished Rubex than before, and I will be introducing you to a new way of writing Ruby code called FDD or Ferrari Driven Development, which will allow you to write Ruby code in a very easy manner without、uh, without too much complexity. Now the reason why this I need to do this is because we all know that Ruby is a really good language, but it's quite slow. So in order to make Ruby faster, many programmers tend to port the Ruby code to C extensions, and they mainly do this for reasons of speed and reliability. Notable examples that use C extensions for Ruby gems are Nokogiri or Fastblank. Nokogiri is a wrapper written over the libxml library, and Fastblank is a plain C extension that is handwritten C code. Both these gems make their respective tasks much faster simply by leveraging the power of C and interfacing it with the C Ruby interpreter. Now the problem is that C extensions have some really big problems. They are very difficult and irritating to write. The learning curve is rather steep. And you need to write a lot of scaffolding code in order to get a simple JavaScript extension running. You also need to manually boot bootstrap this extension with Ruby. And in order to accomplish this, you need to achieve a lot of things which you need to read a lot of documentation for. It's also hard to read and understand public C APIs that are written for C extensions. So, say you have one gem and and it has a C extension. On which another gem depends on, it becomes hard to expose this API in a public manner the way you are used to in, say, object-oriented programming. And you need to care about small things. And as Math says, we are Rubyists, and we don't need to care about small things. So this sucks, and we should change this. Now, various solutions for this purpose exist. One, the first one is Ruby Inline.、Uh, this allows you to write C code inside a simple Ruby string. But it does not scale because it's not、uh, because all the code needs to reside inside one single string and it's not scalable. FFI is quite reductive and requires manual compilation every time. Also, you need to read a lot of docs for making that happen. Swig is very unreadable if your uh, uh, APIs grow over a certain limit. And Helix is a new way of writing these extensions using the Rust programming language, but it's an entirely new language and paradigm that you need to master. So the ideal solution for this problem is to have a super fast and very nice Ruby programming language, but as we know, ideal solutions don't really exist. So, in my opinion, 
a good solution to this problem would be to have a, a new language called Rubex, which I like to think of as a Ferrari for Ruby. It allows you to write Ruby C extensions without losing your developer happiness that you have grown so accustomed to as Ruby developers. In this talk, I will introduce you to some major improvements that have been made to Rubex from last year's talk. The first, uh, the first improvement is that Watashi wa Nihongo hanashimashita. Skoshi hanashimashita. Not, not so much. Otherwise, I'd be talking in Japanese. Um, apart from that, I will be introducing you to a much more stable and, uh, stable and robust language. And there's also been a lot of refactoring of the internal code base of Rubex, apart from a somewhat shift from Rubex's initial goals. So until last year, I thought that Rubex would be a great way to just speed up Ruby and make writing Ruby extensions uh, easier. But now it turns out that an even greater need is to have public C APIs that are accessible and readable through documentation and not having to dive into uh, uh, and not having to dive into the C code of a Ruby C extension in order to use it in another gem. The reason why I think of this is because say you have a Ruby library on top, the green one, and say you want to access the C extension of another gem, which is here. You might think that you can do this in a very straightforward manner, the, the way you are used to in object-oriented programming. But when you actually try to do this, it turns out to be something like this, where you need to dive into the source code of this uh, program and then actually see how these methods are implemented and do a lot of things that you're, not, uh, that you're not supposed to be doing when you're using a public API. So let me introduce you to a small uh, snippet of Rubex. This is a very minimal Rubex program compared to a Ruby program. On the right hand side, you can see the Rubex program. The only difference from the Ruby program is that we have specified integer types for the A and B arguments. And the add method uh, is an exact Ruby method, which is accessible through a Ruby script. The only difference being that it resides inside a C extension. So Rubex will read this method. It will convert the arguments a and b from uh, Ruby objects to C integers. It will make the addition in terms of C, and it will return a Ruby object. To give you a very brief overview of Rubex, this is what the compiler looks like. So the Rubex code resides, uh, is read by a Rubex compiler, which is entirely written in Ruby. That is then compiled into C code that uh, interfaces with the Ruby VM using the C extension API. And then that actually runs inside the C Ruby runtime, just like any other C extension. Now, in order to give you a more detailed example of Rubex, say assume that you are Sebastian Vettel, the f famous Ferrari driver. And at your job, you're given this array. And you need to convert this array into a hash that looks like this. Basically, uh, convert it into uh, uh, the values of the hash need to be the, uh, in the in indices of each of the array numbers. Now, you're confused. How do you do this? Because if you try something like this, the, uh, this is going to be slow. So you have a great idea of using Rubex. And then you just write a Rubex class called array to hash that looks something like this. Notice that this looks almost exactly like a Ruby class but with some add-ons. The first difference is that we are specifying the argument into the convert method as ARR. The ARR tells Rubex that A is always going to be a Ruby array, and it allows Rubex to emit efficient and optimized C code that takes advantage of the internal C-level data structures that represent a Ruby array and avoid things like method lookups that often turn out to be expensive when they are repeated many times inside a loop. Underneath, Rubex will implicitly optimize this call to, uh, the, to the size method on A, and it will convert it into a long integer. And uh, you won't need to actually convert this yourself. Rubex will do it for you. And then you can see that the result, uh, in the, the, the result object is a hash, which has been specified by Rubex. And this will also insert optimized code, uh, which will allow you to directly interface with the hash data structures that are in C instead of going through a Ruby method call. 
over here we are assigning the, res uh, the, the result hash to j and instead of calling the box method on the array and passing the index of j as a Ruby object, Rubex will directly reach into the C array that stores these objects and performs the access on that C array instead. So it's a highly optimized method call and a similar story exists for the hash as well. And then you can just compile this using the Rubex compiler, require the shared object file that it generates and call it through a Ruby script just like you would call any other Ruby method. <coughs> Benchmarking this result yields some really good benchmarks. Uh, you can see that writing this in Rubex is about 1.6 times faster than, the, than just the normal method. And you can do this at a much lesser cost to you as a developer. Now, speed is not the only reason why Rubex exists. The, uh, one of the major reasons is also interfacing with C data types. And to give you an example of this, imagine that you've gone skiing to Hokkaido. And it's really cold over there, so you become something like this. And now you want to wrap a blanket around yourself. But the only way to wrap a blanket is to wrap it inside a Ruby structure and then access it through a Ruby object because you're a Rubyist and you have to access it through Ruby. Now you read up the documentation on how to, access, how to wrap a struct using Ruby and you see all this documentation, these hundreds of methods that you need to use in order to do such a simple thing. So then you use Rubex and then you can just simply write this as a Rubex struct called blanket. Notice that we are uh, implementing the exact same um, uh, data to C data types inside Rubex as we saw earlier without uh, any, any, any difference. And then you just write a class called blanket wrapper. Now what's different about this class from other Ruby classes that are of the similar name is this attach method, attach keyword that you see on the top. The attach keyword tells Rubex compiler that the class called blanket wrapper is supposed to be responsible for all the allocation and deallocations of the of the blanket struct therefore the gc interfacing of the struct is taken care of by rubex and the code that is required for doing this is written by rubex instead of having to be written by you and then you can just write a simple initialize method that will instantiate this class it will also allocate the struct for you you don't need to do anything by yourself What's, just, what's special about this particular attached class is that it has this data dollar variable inside it. The data dollar variable is a special Rubex construct that allows you to access the struct that a class is associated with. You can see that I am uh, calling the blanket name after the data dollar. This name will be replaced by the name of the struct that this class is attached to. And then finally, you can access any of the members of that struct just by using, uh, using the dot operator the way you do in C. Same goes to the owner thing, and same goes for length and breadth. Uh, the, we are accepting Ruby objects into the initialize method, and Rubex is implicitly converting them into C data types by using functions that are already provided in the C API. And then you can write an accessor method called warm factor which simply accesses the struct uh, which has been set in the initialize method and returns that value to the user. The advantages of doing this is that there is almost a three times reduction in the lines of code that you need to write and it exposes this through a friendly Ruby-like interface without any compromise in speed. Now, one of the big hurdles of writing C extensions is that it's really hard to manage this code base. So if any of you have written any C program, you know that there are no namespaces in C the way we have in C++ or, or, or in Ruby. And the, uh, Rubex will allow you to seamlessly define C and Ruby functions using the class and module terminology of Ruby. So this is a simple Rubex class. Uh, in this function, in this code sample, you can see two functions, bar and bas, inside a class called foo. These functions are defined in a slightly different manner than the normal Ruby methods. Let us see what exactly they mean. So on the top, you can see a function called bar that has been defined in a different manner than a normal Ruby method. This is called a C function, and it uses the cfunc keyword 
to tell Rubex that this is a C function and not a Ruby method. We call void to tell Rubex that this is a C function which returns a which, which returns a value of type void, basically it returns nothing, and it accepts a argument of type integer and, and, and a Ruby object called B. And then this is a normal Ruby method called Baz, which will be accessible from, uh, from another Ruby script. Uh, again, this is, you're specifying float C, so it will implicitly convert from Ruby object to float. So this functionality allows you to define public APIs for your C extensions. And these extensions exist in a separate file. Uh, or, sorry, public APIs rest, rest in a separate file called rubexd extension. And this is what a sample file will look like. So say you have a class called class and one more called other class. You can simply define the names of the functions inside this class, put it inside a rubexd file. And when you have another C extension that also uses Rubex, you can simply require this file inside that function, inside that Rubex extension, and use these functions just like any other uh, Ruby API. So the advantage is that you can easily import this through a, a separate Rubex require statement, and the compiler will understand that this is supposed to be an API call. And you, can, you only need to supply the compiled binary and API files like most C libraries. So, also, you don't need to auto-generate the packaging and the compiling code for this. Now, another problem with Ruby is the GIL. And Koichi talked about guilds today, but that's still a while away. And I think uh, it's important to have a mechanism to easily release the GIL, especially in C extensions that require a lot of numerical computing. So to give you a brief overview of the GIL, this is what uh, a, a diagram of the GIL would look like. You have this GIL and you have these green threads. Green threads are uh, actually Ruby threads when you spawn them, and they don't really translate into actual OS threads. So the GIL basically limits uh, the, uh, actual multi-threading in Ruby. And in order to give you a more comprehensive example of um, how this thing can be solved, how you can spawn CPU threads via Ruby. Let me give you a more comprehensive example of reading a simple file uh, using Rubex. So say you have a file with 500,000 lines with a value at each line, and you want to read this into memory and compute the average of these values. Now, you want to distribute this among four threads, uh, re reading the line, and then you want to compute the sum of each value. Uh, compute the sum of all these at, at each thread, and then you want to get the average of all these values. Now, the ideal scenario would be to distribute this among four processes, uh, four CPUs, which will happen in the case of JRuby or even C. But if you have the GV, GIL in between, it will uh, inhibit two multi-threading, and it will only let you access the CPU one thread at a time. So in order to solve this problem, Rubex provides a no GIL block, which is a simple way to release the GIL without, without really breaking your head over it. So this is a small example of releasing the GIL using the no GIL block. Notice that the only thing that we do, sorry. Notice that the only thing that we do is provide a block called no GIL, similar to a begin or rescue block in Ruby. And whatever code that we write inside this GIL block will be released, uh, will be run after releasing the GIL. So Rubex will insert code that will release the GIL, run your code, and get the GIL back so that you can do this safely. Once you write a method called sum computation, which releases the GIL, you can simply call this method using Ruby threads. And since this is inside uh, the, the thread block, it will release the GIL, call that function inside a CPU thread, and then you will get the results uh, back in Ruby. So I actually implemented this uh, using a very using the same example that I showed before, and the G, uh, benchmarks were pretty impressive. So without the GIL, uh, with the GIL in Ruby, took this much time, which is about 355 times slower, and without the GIL in C, took about three was about 350 times faster than this. Just the C implementation without releasing the GIL was twice as slow. 
So you can see the power of doing this. Now this is a very uh, crude way of showing benchmarks, but I took a, H, uh, took a screenshot of my edge top when this thing was running. And you can see that without the GIL, you get almost 100% CPU utilization. And uh, using threads, uh, using green threads, uh, it's about like this, which is clearly not up to the mark. You can see this code at this repo, uh, Wardrose Rubex CSV Reader. And uh, you can play around with it and see how it actually works. The limitations of GIL release are that you can only use C data structures inside of the GIL block. And uh, if you use Ruby methods, it will give you a segmentation fault because Ruby does not support uh, uh, running Ruby methods or Ruby objects outside of the GIL. And uh, you need to be careful with this because if this code runs along with some code that depends on the GIL, that code will most probably break. Now, exception handling is also a very problematic case in the case of C extensions. Uh, previously, when you had to write exception, when you had to write exception handling code in C extensions, you had to call many C functions. So basically, you had to call RB raise for raising the error, then all these rescue and protect methods for the rescue and ensure blocks, and then you had to manually fetch the error using RB error info, which is also a pain. So this causes the workflow of error handling in C extensions to be very complex. And it's almost, there's almost zero compliance with the zero uh, begin ensure block workflow that all of us are used to in Ruby. Now, Rubex allows you to define this using a very simple Ruby-like syntax. So you can just specify a begin block the way you do in Ruby. And whatever code you specify inside this will be automatically put inside the uh, relevant C methods that are required for this purpose. Uh, this is all about my talk for Rubex, and you can see uh, Rubex for yourself at this link. Uh, there are some major differences between Ruby and Rubex. For one thing, uh, you must specify brackets for function calls. Uh, code might be a little less beautiful, but I think that's a fine trade-off, no problem. Uh, and you must also specify return keywords uh, before returning from each function. And right now, it doesn't support blocks or closures. Uh, the diff major differences from C are that the value of operator is not supported, which should not make a difference because there are other constructs that help you deal with this. And you can find some notable Rubex examples uh, on the examples folder in the Rubex repo. And also, there's the array to hash gem, which is a gem that is entirely written in Rubex and uh, is a C extension. You can find detailed documentation and tutorials about Rubex on the repo. There's an entire language specification in the reference.md file. And the tutorial contains a very small and brief tutorial, which you can use for porting some of your C extensions to Rubex. To conclude, I would like to say that Rubex is a fast and productive way of writing C extensions. And the most important thing about Rubex is that it provides very good abstractions for writing C extensions without any cost to performance. The only performance cost is that you need to go through a separate compile step, but that doesn't matter as much as having a runtime overhead or sacrificing your productivity. Now, every time at Ruby Kaigi, I like to talk about some new ideas that uh, I or SciRuby has been working on over the past year. And uh, this year is no exception. So there are some new ideas for writing Rubex. And one of them is tight memory views. So basically, we have uh, Numo and Array gem, which is a gem, which is a linear algebra library for Ruby. And the Zen matrix, which is also a similar library. Now what happens is that uh, if, if you can treat these as C arrays uh, using, say, a, a, a typed syntax, you can directly access the C arrays inside these objects without having to go through any overheads. So you'll have Ruby-like code uh, uh, accessible through Rubex uh, that, that, is very that is as fast as C code. And then there's also a plan to uh, do direct interfacing to GPUs through native kernels, through native CUDA kernels, similar to what has been implemented in uh, Julia implementation. And uh, we'll also be integrating with GDB so that debugging Rubex is very simple. One more very important idea is Ruby plot. And the reason why this is, I think, a very, very important project is because uh, Ruby is a very mature language, 
but I think it's completely ridiculous that we don't have a very mature language uh, plotting ecosystem the way there is in other language communities. Now there are various partial solutions that exist for plotting in Ruby. Uh, matplotlib.rb is the most notable and robust example, I think, because it interfaces to the Python matplotlib via pycall.rb. Uh, Nyaplot is bokeh-like, but it has been abandoned now. And uh, there are various solutions that interface with other libraries like uh, gnuplot or Google charts or high charts. But the problem with these is that they are third-party web tools, and some of them are also paid, so they're not accessible to everybody. So we think that Rubyplot can change that by creating a native plotting solution in C++, which will interface with ImageMagick, GTK, and GR to create a powerful plotting tool for Ruby. And the difference between Rubyplot and Matplotlib will be that Rubyplot will be language independent. So it will be basically be a C++ library that will be ready to interface with Ruby or any other language. And this will allow us to leverage the contributions from other language communities. Because apart from Ruby, there are many other languages who want to create, uh, language communities who want to create mature plotting ecosystems for their respective ecosystem. You can view the progress of Rubyplot on our discourse forum and also on GitHub. And currently, the uh, project is in a very nascent stage. It started about one month ago. So if you have any good contributions or opinions, this is the time to make them. And this will really help, in, uh, this will really help and take us a long way in making Ruby a better solution for plotting and visualization. Another solution, another new idea is a common array library. Now we have nmatrix and numo n array, which are the two major array libraries. And uh, it's, I think it's important to bridge this divide and build a library that is robust and well supported. So the potential answer, I think, is a library called Plurus that is a language independent C backend to NumPy. Plurus is supported by Quonsite and the creators of NumPy. And they have actually started a process to abstract all the um, all the functionality of NumPy into these C libraries. And uh, uh, they have talks to create a Ruby front end for this so that we can also leverage their work. Uh, this, is, this project has not started yet, and I would love to talk to all of you and see how, how we can take this forward. Or is it even essential to take it forward? And uh, for this talk, I would like to thank the Ruby Association grant, Murata-san, Sasada-san, and Seo-san for their support and the Fukuoka Ruby Award, and of course, the Ruby Science Foundation. I also have many SciRuby stickers, so if you want a sticker, just come and say hi, and I will give you as many stickers as you want. And arigato gozaimasu. Hello, thank you for the talk, it was great. Um, I'm wondering if you're thinking of, uh, if, I don't know if you know Truffle Ruby. Yes. Uh, basically, like, I think it can solve part of the problem or it like, can be complementary to, say, Rubex, mm -hmm. at least on the performance point of view. Like, the accessing CPI, it's kind of a different story, so I don't want to go into that. But uh, do you think, like, as Ruby implementation mature and become faster, will we need Rubex for performance still or not? Uh, so if Ruby becomes as fast as, say, Julia is, uh, which is, like, almost as fast as native code, then we probably will not need C extensions in the first place. So, and then we won't need Rubex. Uh, but I think as long as we need C extensions and public APIs for these C extensions, uh, Rubex can provide a very good solution for uh, creating good APIs that can be used, uh, th that can interface with the C part of a Ruby library. So for performance, maybe you know, five years down the line, Rubex probably will not be as useful. But I think uh, the API and the abstraction part is a very useful thing. And I think that's what Cython is also useful for mostly these days. Because uh, say you have projects like Numba, which is like a, a very fast compiler for Python code. And that runs as almost as fast as the equivalent C++ code, uh, effectively taking away the need for Cython. So, uh, and, uh, you know, something like that. Okay, thank you. So. Hey, I have a question for, for how fast the hash, hash to array, because uh, it, it looks inside, it's using Ruby's hash, so it's the same, the same speed for me. Why it was fast? Uh, so, 
uh, the you specify the hash uh, as a as a ruby hash and rubex knows that that particular object is a ruby hash so because of that it will access the uh, hash data structure directly and it will use macros that are provided by the cfpi mm -hmm. to access the internal uh, hash uh, of 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 the c structure mm -hmm. so it won't call the uh, uh, ruby method on the hash it will directly reach into the data structure that represents a hash and return that value oh, okay thank you understand yeah. Uh, can Rubex code run under pure Ruby uh, for de de debugging? Uh, can you repeat, please? Uh, uh, can uh, Rubex code seems to run only Rubex? So, is it right? Uh, it can be run under Ruby com uh, Ruby interpreter. Can it run under Ruby interpreter? Oh uh, yes. So it it runs only under the Ruby interpreter. It will not run as a standalone program. Sorry, uh, if I I don't uh, if I don't have C, C compiler in some environment, uh, can I run? Ah, uh, so it will need a C compiler, uh, and it will need a, the Rubex compiler. So the first stage is compiling from a Rubex program to a C program, and the second stage is compiling from a C program. to a shared object that interfaces with c ruby so both gcc or clang or whatever c compiler you use are important in that process so uh, if even if it is, it is so uh, i can i run rubex code without compiler yes yes thank you samir thank you very much